Hey guys, today I'm out in Salt Lake City, Utah at the Land Cruiser Museum because Toyota has finally pulled the covers off the all new 2024 Land Cruiser and there it is. This is gonna be Toyota's most off-road focused vehicle, at least until we see some further additions of the Land Cruiser, of course. Now, two big changes for 2024. The Land Cruiser has become more affordable. The price tag is gonna start in the $50,000 range and it's become smaller. That was one of my complaints about the previous generation Land Cruiser, the 200 series, that it had grown quite a lot. And it meant that on narrow trails, sometimes it felt a bit too big. That is not gonna be the case with this. This is nearly five inches narrower. It's also shorter. And that means that it's gonna be easier to fit on some of those off-road trails. But it definitely has a lot of Land Cruiser DNA in the styling. There are gonna be two different front end looks, interestingly. If you get the base model or the heritage trim, we get round headlights giving it a nod back to Land Cruisers of the past. Some of the Land Cruisers that are, for instance, right behind me in this shot. If you see a little bit of FJ Cruiser in the design, you're not alone because Toyota considers it part of the Land Cruiser family. But let's get back to this very blue model. This very blue model has the more horizontal theme with the very square three module LED headlights. Of course, very square grill openings right here as well with the Toyota logo there. One interesting twist I noticed is that the radar sensor for the adaptive cruise control and safety systems is integrated into the grill, not integrated into the windshield. And that's something that I would have liked to have seen with the Land Cruiser, because if you plan on modifying the front end by putting brush guards or things like that on your Land Cruiser, that could interfere with the active safety systems. Obviously, we have a 360 degree camera sensor right there. As you move around to the side, the boxy theme continues. And I think it has a really great presence. You can definitely see some modernity in its styling, but also a lot of historic cues with this very horizontal hood there, very upright proportion, this kick up right here on the rear door. The closest relative in the rest of the Toyota Lexus lineup is the new Lexus GX. So a lot of the goodness that we've already seen in that new GX model that hopefully I'll be driving soon is baked right here into the Land Cruiser. These are the optional 265 70R18s. There are also gonna be some slightly skinnier tires on the base model. Now, I've talked to a lot of folks that are a bit disappointed in the ground clearance on the Lexus GX. This is gonna be pretty similar, just under nine inches of clearance. And there's a reason for that. It has a solid axle in the back. So the only way you can increase ground clearance in a solid axle vehicle is by making the wheels and tires larger in diameter. And that's certainly something that you could do aftermarket on this Land Cruiser. We don't have an independent suspension in the rear. And when you take a look at the really high ground clearance that you find in a Grand Cherokee or a Range Rover, the main reason for that extra ground clearance is they have an independent suspension that can push those tires all the way down with the airbags on the vehicle. This does not have that capability. It's a more robust design, a more traditional design as well. And because it has a solid axle in the rear, I would suspect you could also swap yourself into a solid axle up front, really increasing the capability. We see that in some folks uh, that have done that to a Bronco. Back here in the rear, we find a small spoiler up top. We find a separately opening rear glass. This is a feature that I really love, really improves cargo practicality. Kind of a cool touch is that the windshield wiper is actually a, sort of floating right there on the glass and it engages with that little module right there on uh, the actual hatch itself. Let's go ahead and open the hatch and see how that looks. You see in this model, we have the optional power hatch. Let's take a look at the cargo area. It is definitely nice and square as you'd expect. The spare tire is underneath the vehicle. And of course that solid axle occupies a little bit of room as far as uh, packaging efficiency goes. This is a very early pre-production prototype, but we have a little bit of additional storage space back here. Uh, we also have some cargo retention hooks to make that cargo area more practical and a 2400 watt inverter outlet back here. That's suitable to power all sorts of things on your camping adventure, microwaves. Um, you could even do a toaster oven, something like that. Go ahead and close the hatch. Under this area is where we would find a hitch receiver. I can't take that panel off, unfortunately, but we do have a four pin and a seven pin wiring harness connection. The high capacity inverter is possible because of what's under the hood in every Land Cruiser in North America. This is Toyota's new 2.4 liter rear wheel drive hybrid system. It mates a 2.4 liter turbocharged engine to an eight speed automatic transmission and an electric motor. The combination gives you 326 horsepower and 465 pound feet of torque. That's definitely suitable for a lot of off-road adventures. It's also good for 6,000 pounds of towing capability. Interesting twist, this hybrid system and the four wheel drive system is closely related to what we find in the new Toyota Tacoma. Uh, actually, I guess you could say that the Tacoma system is related to this because this is the vehicle that system was designed for. It uses a true center differential with a two speed transfer case and a locking mode on the center differential. So full time four wheel drive 
and the extra capability that you get in a true center differential. That ability to have all the power going to all the wheels, but have them all spin at different rates. That's something that we don't find in all the competition. Depending on the type of off-roading, this is gonna tear up that trail less. So if you're environmentally minded and you worry about trail damage, that's an important feature. And it also means that you have the ability to send power to both axles, even in snowy situations, rainy situations, et cetera, where a locked center coupling would not be appropriate. Of course, if you wanna lock the center, you can do that. You can also get a locking rear differential. Before we take a look at the inside, let's take a look at this 1958 edition. This is effectively the base model Land Cruiser, at least for the moment, but the front end style shares a little bit with the first edition that will be the top end trim of Land Cruiser, mainly the round headlight design. Let me know which look you prefer. I have to admit, I really like the round headlights more than I thought I would when I heard that the Land Cruiser was finally going to be getting a bit of a retro vibe here and there. It certainly is retro with modern though, with the modules to the side that are still very square, this very square front bumper area here, the front grille rather, with these very square openings. We have LED fog lights below, a touch I really appreciate. Well integrated parking sensors. Definitely some nod to aerodynamics and modernity here as well. We actually have functional air intakes on the side that help reduce drag in the front. Now under the front, interestingly, you won't find skid plates until you get to the top end trims. Obviously you can add them yourself aftermarket, but you're not gonna find them from the factory on the base Land Cruiser. Let's take a look at the other changes for the Land Cruiser 1958. Obviously we get unique wheels and tires. These are the smaller 245, 17, R18 wheels and tires. Pretty similar styling to the side of the vehicle with those very squared off wheel arches. I suspect you could certainly stick larger diameter wheels and tires on here if you wanted to. Now back, not too much changes. We still have these separately opening rear glass. A Little bit of style difference, of course, as far as what's body colored and what's not. And then we have a manual hatch for the cargo area rather than the powered hatch. Now, one thing I should mention back here while we're talking about it is some folks might wonder what is going on under this section. Most likely it's the battery. Again, we have that small cargo area right up front. We have the spare tire underneath the Land Cruiser, but the battery pack that is of course standard since the hybrid system is standard is gonna be positioned right there behind the second row seats. Part of why we don't find a third row, you really wouldn't get a lot of storage space back behind that area. If you want a third row in a vehicle this format, you could take a look at the Lexus GX. It should have one, but it's gonna have a very, very small cargo area behind. It's also gonna be more expensive. Now let's take a look inside. Obviously the first thing you'll notice about this 1958 edition is that we have manual seats. And that's a feature I actually like um, because if you're really worried about longevity, you don't want the power doodads, you really plan on taking your Land Cruiser more rugged off-road, you're probably gonna wanna skip some of the power accessories. We have a manual tilt telescopic steering column, obviously no memory seats over there, but we still have the trailer brake controller in the dashboard that I showed you earlier. The door panels, those do change a little bit same shape that we find in the other Land Cruiser that you saw earlier, but we get mostly hard plastics, again, for increased durability on the doors. We even have a hard armrest for the driver. That is the one area where I wish they'd given us some squishier plastics. Let's check out the back seat. That front seat was very comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall. Back here, plenty of room, also plenty of headroom thanks to the very upright profile. Now, this model does not have the power moonroof that is available, and you'll notice that if I move all the way over to this side, and you really take a look at the headroom in here, I have absolutely gobs and gobs of it, just as you'd expect out of a Land Cruiser. Uh, the rear seats have a decent amount of recline as well, even in this model. You can square off the cargo area by putting them in that position, or you could give yourself a very relaxing rear seat experience. Uh, here in the center of everything, we have air vents for the rear passengers, little Land Cruiser logo right there on top, USB charge ports, and a 12 volt charge port as well. Under this Velcro panel, the outboard rear seats have latch anchors for child seats, and take a look at that upholstery. I really like the look. It is certainly very, very retro, so I could see a lot of folks not liking it, I think it's absolutely fantastic. Rear passengers also get a fold down armrest with two cup holders right there in the middle. As we look around the interior, keep in mind this is a pre-production prototype, so obviously there are gonna be some changes for the final edition. There are definitely lots of premium materials on the door, but I would say it's not quite as premium as the Land Cruisers have been in the past because of the repositioning of this model as a more affordable Land Cruiser. If you want that luxury Land Cruiser experience, there is of course the Lexus LX. We definitely have comfortable and attractive front seats. Let's go ahead and take a look at that rear seat room back there. My videographer and editor Alexandra is back there. She has plenty of room back there, as you can see two-way adjustable headrests, heated and ventilated front seats, of course, in this top-end trim. 
The dashboard air vents have a very round theme, sort of contrasting with the square front end on this model, but obviously harmonizing with the model that has the round headlights. We find soft touch materials on the upper section of the dash, a stitched midsection, a little bit of piping right there to help dress things up. Down below, we have mostly a slot style glove compartment. There's plenty of room in there, but I don't know if you could fit some of those larger tablet computers because this is a little bit taller than it is deep. But I still think a pretty practical storage area. We also have some soft plastics lower on the dashboard, which is something that I hadn't expected. They're not as soft as the upper ones. It's more of a soft coating on top of the hard plastic. Moving up to the dashboard, we find one of two different infotainment systems. This is the larger system available. If you get the smaller one, then I think the power and volume knob is in kind of a better place. I do think this looks a little odd with that little module sort of tacked on there right between the instrument cluster and the infotainment system itself. The smaller system is going to have a bigger bezel and the knob is going to be right there on the front. This of course has Toyota's latest connected infotainment system, so pretty similar to what we've seen in the rest of Toyota's lineup. Moving down from there, we find the engine start, stop button, tow haul mode right over there, two large air vents in the center along with all the controls for the climate control, heated and ventilated seats, all that sort of stuff going on there. There are lots of physical buttons and knobs in here. So if you're a fan of physical buttons and knobs, you'll definitely like this. Below that we have a Qi wireless charging mat, the button for the 360 degree camera system, USB inputs. As you can see, it has Toyota's sort of augmented reality 360 degree camera system right there. What the knob does is chosen by this button bank down here. It's a drive mode knob at the moment. We can then change it to a multi-terrain select knob or a DAC crawl control knob. We have a pretty traditional console shifter right down here, just as you'd expect. Electric parking brake, auto brake hold, some controls for the four wheel drive system over here. You can lock the center coupling, lock the rear differential. We have four high and four low with that little toggle. Nice big cup holders right there between the front seats. The padded center armrest opens to reveal a relatively small storage area, as you'd expect. It's a bit deeper than some versions of the Land Cruiser have been, but remember, there's an all-wheel drive system and a transmission under that center console. Now, over on the driver's side, I have to warn you that this Land Cruiser has a low battery, so its infotainment system and instrument cluster aren't working quite right. But we do have a full LCD instrument cluster available. There's going to be a slightly smaller LCD in the base model. And then we have this big truck-style steering wheel, but thankfully they didn't just borrow this from the Tundra. They have changed it, squared it off a bit, made it look more like you'd expect in a rugged Land Cruiser. You can see that we have a different style airbag section here. Keep in mind, again, this is a pre-production prototype, so some of these finishes are actually a little bit hand done, which is why things look a little rough around that airbag cover. Over here, we find controls for the adaptive cruise control system. On this side, we find controls for the infotainment system. We then have volume toggles, track forward, backward, and a mode button there as well. There are also paddle shifters on the back of the steering wheel, driver attention monitoring system right there behind the steering column. And then over here is where we find the uh, controls for the headlights, turn signal stock, etc. That's all pretty similar to the rest of the Toyota lineup in the US. With 6,000 pounds of towing capability, you might be wondering where the trailer brake controller is. It's over here to the driver's left. That's where we find the adjustment buttons. Also some additional controls for things like the inverter, the fog lights, etc. We do have a powered steering column. And then over here on the driver's door, we have the controls for the two position seat memory, window switches, etc. The biggest differences for the base model interior are going to be the smaller LCDs on the driver's side and of course in the center of everything and the changed plastics on the dashboard. So for instance, we find harder plastics on the dash right around that Land Cruiser stamped logo in the dashboard. And again, harder plastics on the front doors as well. We still find carpet down here, but we have rubber floor mats. I was actually a little bit surprised that they didn't go for more of a vinyl look for the interior. You can see how that knob integrates with the smaller screen. I actually think that is a little bit better integrated than the bigger LCD in the other model. Over on the driver's side, you can see that we have a full LCD instrument cluster. Well, actually, I guess not quite full LCD since we do have some LED gauges on either side, but it's a little bit smaller than that other model. Going back to the center, pretty much everything here is the same. You can see we still have a place to stick your smartphone right there. We have the same drive mode knobs, things like that. Very similar four wheel drive controls down here with the center locker and the rear locker, four high, four low. And then of course we have a hard plastic center armrest. In this trim, I do wish that Toyota had given us just a few more soft touch points, but we still have a leather wrapped steering wheel, which is something that I do appreciate. The Land Cruiser should be on sale soon, and if you want to know how it drives, stay tuned because I will be driving one of these over the next few months. But before we get to the pricing and opinions, at least the opinions I have at the moment, we should talk about the elephant in the room. What about the Toyota 4Runner? To be honest, we don't have any information about that. I would honestly be very surprised if the 4Runner did not get a next generation. 
But I am also surprised that the Land Cruiser ended up shrinking and it became less expensive. Again, it's gonna start somewhere in the $50,000 range. Probably mid 50s would be my guess for the base edition of this. That does give a reasonable amount of room for a new Toyota 4Runner to arrive, but that would mean that Toyota would have a lot of body on frame SUVs. They're gonna have this, they're gonna have the Sequoia, they're gonna have the Lexus GX, the Lexus LX, et cetera. And that is a lot of body on frame goodness. Forerunner, however, sells in incredible numbers, and this is going to be built in Japan. So I would not be surprised if there was a less expensive Forerunner that was built in the United States specifically for the North American market. This does give us maybe a glimpse into that future because the Forerunner might, might not come with the hybrid system standard like we find on this Land Cruiser. That could be a point of differentiation. Now, as far as the Land Cruiser itself goes, this looks fantastic. And I think they nailed the price tag exactly on the head. If you're looking at a four-door Bronco especially, I would say you should give the new Land Cruiser a look. I like the look up front. I think it looks really sharp. We also have that standard hybrid system. It's probably not going to be the world's most efficient hybrid. I will disclose that right up front. We don't have final fuel economy numbers yet, but in every vehicle that Toyota has used this hybrid system design in, the fuel economy bump has been fairly minor. Uh, remember that this hybrid system is thematically similar to what we find in the Tundra hybrid. It only gets about one mile per gallon better than the non-hybrid version. We also find a very similar hybrid system available in some of the other rear wheel drive Lexus models. This hybrid system bears no relationship to what we find in the international market Lexus IS and formerly the Lexus GS sedans. This is an entirely different design with a traditional eight speed automatic transmission, which is why we have that high payload and high towing capability in the vehicle. It of course does also mean that once that battery is exhausted, you're gonna have whatever power the 2.4 liter turbo puts out, but that's still a decent amount of torque for your next off-road adventure. And because it's a traditional eight-speed automatic, the experience is gonna be very smooth, very traditional as far as that off-roading adventure goes. Let me know what you think of the design and what you think of the Land Cruiser coming back as a smaller, more off-road focused, hybrid only vehicle. I have to admit, I really want to see what Toyota will do for future generations. You can see that these wheel wells are pretty darn large. So you could logically increase your ground clearance and increase your capability with some big meaty all-terrain tires. I don't know exactly how big you could go without body modifications or lifting, but you can see you definitely have some room to upgrade. That would improve your approach and departure angles. It would definitely improve your ground clearance and of course, improve your off-road traction capability. For all that and more, be sure and stay tuned. Hit that subscribe button down there at the bottom of your screen. Find us over at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Threads, all those other social media platforms that are proliferating at an enormously crazy rate. And I will see all of you out on the trail when I can get this out on that trail. See all of you later.